All right, you ready? You ready, everybody? All right, good. Here we go. Welcome to Atomic Game Theory. My name is Richard. I am here to teach you all about two of my favorite games and talk about a lot of the major game theory ideas that we see in them. Game theory is a look at mathematics, politics, economics, strategy, tactics, in order to teach you how to, you know, win and succeed at your favorite board games. Um, like I said, my name is Richard. If you have any questions throughout the show that you want to get answered as we're, we're here, we are on Twitch Live right now, and you can always check in on the chat there, uh, ask any questions. I'll be able to check those a few times, because this is school, and you should get your questions answered. You can also tweet at me at Armelina, uh, and I'll be checking that throughout the show as well to see if we got any questions there, but I'm glad you're here, and uh, let's start talking about some games. All right, so first up out of our two games that we have for today. I'm very excited about both of these games, and I hope that we get to, to learn a whole bunch of stuff about how each of them work. I'm so excited, especially for my first one, Junk Orbit by the wonderful Daniel Solis. I love, first of all, just this container is fantastic. How many, how many round containers do you have? It feels like it's gonna be filled with Duplos. Were they in round boxes? Legos, one of those? Uh, I love this game so much, and uh, I was very excited to get to play it with Daniel Solis for the first time, uh, who showed me the ropes and then promptly whooped me at this game. But uh, let's talk about how this one works. Um, once upon a time, not to start with a different game, but that's what I'm going to do. Um, once upon a time, I got to play a game called Gravwell, and uh, it's a game on my shelf somewhere, because uh, I love it. It's so good. Um, and in the game, you are playing a, a rocket, basically, that's trying to escape a gravity well. And as you are playing the game, you get to draw these cards, which allow you to move certain distances in relation to the other objects in the gravity well. So you might have an object or a card that says, hey, move six spaces towards the nearest object. And that seems pretty straightforward, but all the players play their cards. You lock them in at the same time, and then everyone flips them, and then you see what happens. Potentially, the satellite that was ahead of you is going to be the thing you move towards, but maybe someone else has gotten in the way, or maybe a, some, someone has gotten right behind you, and now they are closer, and you find yourself being propelled backwards. Uh, it was a cool mechanic. I really liked it a lot, because it talks about space dynamics, which I think is fun. Um, but the end game was very difficult, because as you get farther towards the end, there aren't a lot of cards that push you away from objects. They're always kind of pulling you towards them. And if you're out in the lead, you just can't win the game that way. you got to push. And so the end of the game always got very long, um, unfortunately, because I loved it. And that is one of the reasons why I was so excited with Junk Orbit. Because it deals with these kind of spatial movement mechanics in a very, very, very cool way. All right. Are we ready? Are we ready? I'm going to check this thing out. There we go. Um, this is Junk Orbit. Um... What you see here in front of you are uh, the Earth, the Moon, and Mars. I have this set up for two or three players. If you play with more than that, you can also add the moons of Mars to uh, get some more space on here. But all the way around them are these little tiles right here. There we go. There's Bradbury. Um, and what we have is, first of all, very, very clever. Uh, number one, there's like the heart-shaped box down there at the bottom. Uh, we have all sorts of references to sci-fi items across this whole thing. We'll see tricorders, we'll see uh, hoverboards, we'll see phaser. I mean, there's all sorts of stuff. There's, uh, there's a very Game Boy-looking thing down here as well. Um, so that part's cool at the start. These are pieces of space junk. And you are trying to take them and deliver them around uh, this planetary system. I guess this, you know, solar system. We'll go with that. Um, the route, the route from Earth to Mars. Um, you'll see up at the top that it has two pieces of information and all of them have very similar pieces. There is a number, this one has the number six, and a word Bradbury. Bradbury is one of the locations on this route. And in fact, because it is red, I can tell that it is on Mars. And in fact, Bradbury is way down here at the very end. All right, so how this game works is you are trying to pick up this space junk and you are trying to deliver it to its proper location, its home, where it wants to be, uh, which is tons of fun. As you go, of course, the way that you move is by spending these same tokens. These are your resources, you gather them. They're worth victory points if you can deliver them, but the only way to move in space is to propel yourself by pushing junk out the window behind you, and that launches you forward. Oh, okay. So this leads to 
some ridiculous situations that I just love and I want to talk about real quick. Well, today, this half hour at the very least. We won't start with them just yet because I can talk more about the game. Um, game is so good. You have a couple of tiles in your hand at the very start. Uh, one, one, and two that'll push you a little bit as you try to move through this board. But the bigger numbers are out here. They're, they're the junk you were going to encounter. So on your turn, you are going to... Well, first you got to move. And you move by launching your pieces um, behind you. And that propels you in the opposite direction. Uh, now if we take a look at kind of the, the way the board is set up and we think about orbits a little bit... Uh, a rule that comes up here is going to make really, really good sense. And the rule is that we're moving kind of gravitationally. We're moving in gentle curves. Um, if I launch this two behind me, right, say uh, that I will play uh, the, the black rocket right here. We'll talk more about these in a second. Um, I can launch it behind me, and it actually goes one, two spaces behind me. And then I move one, two spaces ahead of me. Um, it's fantastic. If I had larger pieces, I could go farther. Say I was in the exact same position, but I also had this six right here. This is where I think the game gets a lot of fun. Um, I get to move six spaces, and I get to decide how I want to move around this system, but some choices are not open to me. Uh, for example, we have these two spaces right here. One of them is Kilimanjaro, um, which is kind of like a, a directional axis right here. Um, there's also Olympus over here on Mars. Whenever you get to these, they are tied to locations on the moon, and you can change direction at those places. Otherwise, you can't actually change direction. So you can't just decide um, halfway through your movement to start moving backwards or anything like that, because that's not what happens when you throw something behind you in space. You go the direction you're going until something stops you. I keep shaking the table. Sorry about that. So if I threw this one out six behind me, uh, one, two, it's going to go in gentle curves, so I cannot decide to make it go this way. That would be like a spike, and that doesn't make any sense. Um, but one, two, I could send this out to Mars. Three, four, five, six. And it would drop right there, and I would move this way six. Three, four, five, six. Or I could decide to continue in orbit. So one, two, three, four, five, six down here. There's a lot of different ways to move in the game, and, uh, and that kind of like circular motion keeps it really interesting. It's hard to get exactly where you want to go in a single movement, but you're trying really hard. Because you want to deliver these things. You want to deliver them to the places that they are supposed to go. And if I know that this one goes to Bradbury, well, and I want to deliver it, I better not be launching myself towards the Earth, right? Um, as the game progresses, every time you land on a spot, you can deliver anything you have that has the name of that spot on it. So if I were on Istanbul and I had tokens for Istanbul, I could turn them in. Uh, they are worth victory points at the end of the game, equal to the number up at the top. So, Bradbury, this card is worth six, or this tile right here. Um, so, in a sense, I want to deliver these big, huge tiles, because they're worth a ton of victory points. At the same time, they're the tiles that let me move very quickly around this board, and moving quickly around the board is what gives me victory points. So, uh, I have some tough choices to make as I play. Um... What else do we got in here uh, in this fantastic game? Um, we have, number one, uh, the fact that all of the players have unique abilities. Um, you may be playing the Puddle Jumper, and what that one says, if we can read it here, is when your ship moves, you may move at a distance of exactly one, regardless of what you actually launched. So that means you can do this very slow, methodical movement if you choose to. You, you don't have to worry about holding on to these ones and twos, or, uh, or gathering other ones and twos from around the board. Um, doesn't matter quite so much. Um, maybe you have the Century Fly instead. Uh, the Century Fly says you may pick up junk from one adjacent city instead of your current city. Oh, that just came through. Okay, nice work, camera. Um, ooh, okay, so that's good. That's very good. Um, that means I need to be a little less careful about how I am traveling around if I want to pick junk up, um, if, uh, if instead I want to deliver, there is actually another card that lets you do that. All of the colors have special abilities. The Space Cowboy, orange, allows you to deliver to places next to you. Um, blue allows you to make those sharp corners that you weren't allowed to before. I get that little diagram right there. Bam, you can change directions uh, very wildly. Um, finally, the Interplanet Express, if you launch tiles that originated from the Earth, 
then you can add or subtract one to your, your distance whenever you are launching them. So all of them have different ways to play. All of your players have slightly different things going on. All of those are also two-sided. And so once you play the game a few times and you decide it's time to really, really, really get into it, um, you can flip them over and you have kind of more like combative versions there. Um, one of the other parts of the game that I find fantastic is as you are moving, um, do, 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 you stop and do your, oh gosh, excuse me. <laughs> um, if you're junk tile, so, so one of the things in the game as well is that there is a little bit of combat. Again, if you turn these over to the B side, uh, they're s significantly more combative. They allow you to do different things. Uh, and that's not great. Um, however, the game does have some combat in it. While you can move through other players, and that's not a big deal, although there is a pirate card on part B and things like that, um, you can throw junk at your opponents. And if you do that, they will be injured, <laughs> which is pretty fun. Um, if when you launch a junk tile, it stops on the same space as one of your opponents, uh, I mean, you're fine. No good for them. Um, that ship is hit, and they must choose a junk tile, either from their cargoes or their deliveries, things they have already dropped off, um, uh, and place it at their ship's current city, so someone else can pick it up later. Picking up junk is a thing you can only do at the end of your turn, so you are not allowed to immediately pick that piece up, as great as that would be. Better now. All right, so... Um, I had to just make sure I got that one right. I knew there was a little bit of combat in the first version of the game, not just the second part, but I wanted to double check the rules. Okay, so as we're playing, we're trying to throw junk at our opponents. We're trying to deliver these things and get as many victory points as possible as we do it. We're trying to make sure that we are going to places that have junk of similar types. Like if I look over here at the Earth right now, um, I see that Tokyo over here has Olympus. This needs to get delivered to Olympus, and it's worth four points. Also, NYC has something bound for Olympus. So if I can gather things with the same city on them, and I start moving towards that city, I'm going to be able to maximize my drop-offs, a thing that I kind of want to do in this game. Um, on the other hand, like I said earlier, you might have to use those to propel yourself over to Olympus, and that is significantly more of a problem in this one. Um, so I love this game because it does allow for this perfect spatial movement. It allows you to explore kind of these gravitational ideas. How do I how do I move around this board? And how do I maximize my victory points as I'm doing so? Um, I think as you play through it the first time, definitely play with the A side so that you're able to see kind of the basic point of the game, how it works, and get those concepts down. Do that well before you start adding part B in, the more combative ways to play because it does get a little bit more uh, intriguing then, I suppose. Um, there's stuff like moving through people will count as a hit, or um, pick up junk that hits you, which is kind of good. The necktie fighter is um, when your opponent hits you, they're also hits. Now we're like running into each other. Um, and they have to discard tiles. Um, Yellow is a planetary defender. You cannot throw junk at them that has a one or a two. They can just, uh, it can go right past them without hurting them because they can drop down on the planet, things like that. So there are, there's a lot more tactically going on in that case. So in uh, game theory terms, this game is about efficiency. How quickly can you deliver all this stuff? Well, first of all, we got to know how the game ends. The game ends on any turn when, for example, at the end of my turn, if I'm on Istanbul, bam, I will take the Bradbury tile into my own cargo section. Get out of here. My own cargo section. We'll say this is all in my cargo. Um, and then I'm going to replace that with a blue tile because the blue tiles have earth on the back. They're from earth. Um, all the earth tiles need to be shipped either to the moon or to Mars. Everything on Mars needs to go to the right. It's always to the other two. You're not going to magically get an earth tile that you can drop off on earth. That's cheating. Um, I don't get to pick this tile up unless I am somehow here at the end of my next turn. So that can be like a little bit of a, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, a little bit of depression because you're looking at it and you're like, but I wanted that one. That was the one I wanted. Sometimes you're picking up one that you don't really want. You're going to throw it away anyways. And 
and then the one that is revealed is the one you want. It's ah, frustrating. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so the turn ends when I can't do that. If I try to place something there, and this this stack has completely run out. Um, the stack is a little bit bigger than this. The game does go more than, you know, that many turns. Um, but it does give us that kind of push, that drive, and you're able to see when the game is supposed to end so that you can start making deliveries. Um, for example, if the red stack is really, really low, and I want the game to continue, I want to get out of Mars as fast as I can, and I want to hope that no one else goes there to end the game. But if I know my opponents are over on Earth, and I start shipping out that way, then the game should go a little bit longer. So there are some clocks in here that are pretty, gosh darn it, pretty interesting, and, um, and give us a sense about when things should end, which is good because I really want to maximize my deliveries as much as possible in this game. Um, because it's all about deliveries, right? So I'm dropping these things off, uh, I'm moving around, um, I'm going to check in real quick. Are there any questions about how this one works? Aha! Jonathan is with us. I like the resource burn mechanic. The junk is both the goals and the fuel. Yes, indeed. So this is a, a very, very cool part of this game, and I love it. I love it. I love it. Um, because I have to make choices, right? And that's really what this is all about, is the choices of, um, uh, excuse me, of utility. This is a perfect utility game, because you have these resources that you have to decide what you want to do with them. You have to decide which is the most important way to play the game. Sometimes it's, it's down to the whims of the game. Um, you know, because it is running close to the end. Uh, but Daniel has thrown in one important part of the game, which I have not gone over, uh, to help fix and alleviate this issue a little bit, because sometimes it gets really frustrating to ship all your good stuff just so, you know, I have all these sixes, but I have to deliver stuff to Earth, so I'm dropping my sixes as I fly over there, and then I'm just delivering these ones and twos? That's no fun. So, if you are ever in a position where you can ship or you, you throw some junk behind you, right, so that you can launch yourself, and you are in a position where that junk gets launched to the place you want it to go. So if I wanted this to go to Bradbury, and I am, I think, on mm, Cerberus, and I send this backwards one, two, three, four, five, it lands on the spot I want it to be on, then I actually get a remote delivery. That's totally cool. That counts as delivered, and I get to add it to my delivery stack. Um, and I get to do that without, you know, still worrying about where I'm going or anything else. So I do have this extra means to get points in the game through junk, but it's hard to do. It is difficult to get that thing set up. Um, often it happens with big numbers while you are around, um, you know, you, you've gathered Mars stuff from Earth and now you're over on Mars and you just happen to be able to drop this stuff in order to move you back towards Earth because you just picked up some new stuff. That part is a ton of fun. I really like it, and it gets very intriguing. Um, the game, the way the game works, is definitely um, as 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 I learned from Daniel. <laughs> you gather a bunch of stuff usually over here from Earth, and people tend to move from Earth, maybe drop something off the Moon on the way, and then go to Mars. And so people are kind of bouncing back and forth as you go. Um, so, which is in a sense good because you can tell where everybody is and it's not like people are going to be able to jet all the way across this board. Even if I'm on like Cairo and I get a six, one, two, three, four, five, six, like I'm just barely getting into Mars at that point. I'm probably not getting from the end to the end in a single turn, even with my biggest numbers. So I can tell where people are, um, but that means that there is a lot of like we're weaving through, we're dropping junk on each other and um, having as much fun as possible as we do it. So. I love it. So that is one of the things I wanted to look at. I'm glad you mentioned it, Jonathan, because it is all about, right, these these resources that have dual purposes and how we decide to use those to our best benefit. Um, Who is a tricky, tricky deal. Anyway, um, this game, uh, Junk Orbit, is uh, is Daniel's. It is out. Uh, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop back to here. There we go. Um, is out by Renegade. Is published by Renegade. Um, find it. Check it out. It. Uh, it's also very cool. I just love the whole setup. I love that it reminds me of like, I don't know, putting blocks in a box or something like that in one of these big, big cubes. It's cool. Um, it is a unique looking game for sure. And I think it absolutely deserves a place on your, cell, on your shelf. Uh, especially if once upon a time uh, you were a big fan of Gravwell. This is, for me, the replacement that fixes that um, entirely. It gives me gravitational movement that I want without uh, necessarily um, adding too much complexity 
Um, or making the end of the game unfun. I mean, the end of this game is a ton of fun. You, as you're moving through, you are, are very easily able to make choices, to deliver things. I mean, yeah, you might have to decide between this or that, but that's, I mean, that's the way the game works. Um, I'm just quickly putting this away. Which is very helpful to have a big, huge tub to dump these in, so thanks for making that. Uh, I promise I'll sort them later. Just, um, <laughs> for right now. We're going to just get these into this wonderful bin. I love it. I love it. Just dump them all in. All right. Um, perfect. So game number one, Junk Orbit. Again, it is it is a game about multi-resource use, and that is a very intriguing way to talk about utility theory and, uh, and try and come up with strategies as you are playing. Um, sometimes a token that you want to deliver, you have to make the decision, no, 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 that's going to become junk that I'm going to throw out. Um, because I got these other things along the way. Uh, it's a very difficult balance. It makes it hard to make easy decisions. Um, and the state of the game is always kind of changing because you get new things to deliver all the time. All right, moving on to part two of, uh, well, yeah, part two of three, I guess, today. Um, before we do that, Jonathan is asking, is it bigger to deliver a lot of small items in a row or shoot for big point wins? That's it. That's like, that's the, the big question of this game. And sometimes um, the answer is both, if that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> um, sometimes um, it is a little bit harder to tell what the right answer to that one is. Um, it really, really depends. I have won with big drops as much as possible because that's how you get victory points. I mean, that's the most. But if you can get in there and really, really, really deliver a ton of small things as you go, if you can get the groups together, if you can get a bunch of small ones that go to the same location, and you can use a single movement to get all of your pieces there, that's amazing. That is perfect. Um, I just struggle to do that, so I will I will gather big ones as I am like hopping slowly around the board with my, my weak, low-cost junk, um, usually and try to drop a bunch of big ones off at the same time. Hello, car. Um, Real quick, I'm drinking coffee today out of my PAX mug. It is PAX this weekend. Uh, I hope everybody's having a really great time there. Because um, PAX is fun. All right. Part two. In order to do part two, I have to do a quick change. All right, car. This is my show. Um, so as I do that, I'm going to swap real quick over to um, to this field real quick. This is a, a quick look at some of the prototyping events that are going on around the nation. Um, if you love games, you should absolutely check some of these out. Up at the top is First Play LA, which is the one that I am attached to. My goodness. <laughs> um, First Play LA is a fantastic one. The game we're about to take a look at was demoed at that game. It's the first opportunity that I had to play it. Um, was there at First Play LA, and... Um, it was a ton of fun, and we get to play, you know, once once or twice a week. I'm sorry, once or twice a month, maybe. <laughs> um, and we are uh, always testing out new games. Usually it's like five or six games every month that we get to play. We could do one big gaming extravaganza where you get to try out a couple different things. And, uh, and we test it so that we can learn about the games and try to make all these games better. And on one hand, it's fantastic because I get to play a ton of games. And on the other hand, it's fantastic because, well, um, I get to help people make better games, which is fun. Um, very, very, very fun. I'm very excited about getting to do that all the time. So, um, doo -doo -doo. I'm just setting up game number two right now. Um, it required a quick camera change. Um, I know that Daniel Solis uses game designers of North Carolina as, as one of his groups. There are many of them that he promotes. Um, Protospiel is another major one. Um, they have events all over the country, all over the world, I believe. Um, and finally, Playtest Northwest, just to promote the hometown, has tons of events that they are also doing. Again, just trying to build better games, because that's what all these people are, are all about. Um, if you are ever interested in joining a prototyping playtesting group, check them out. They are all fantastic and uh, are helping make our games better. All right? So do, take a look at those. I love them. Um, what's a, what we're gonna take a look at now is is a very 
very, very different game. <laughs> I promise you that parts of it are the same, um, but at the same time, holy cow, is this different. Uh, I think I have my camera set to the right bit, so we're going to check it out in just a second um, to find out how we did. But this game is called Promenade, uh, and it is by Tate Wu, and it is, uh, who is, a, again, a fellow member of the uh, First Play LA, and that's where I first got to play this game. Uh, it came out on Kickstarter, oh my gosh, three months ago, maybe, and I am holding a copy in my hand already. Tate is a fantastic designer, uh, pumping out games. He's got uh, quite a few little... Uh, smaller scale games called, um, let's see, Cat Rescue was one, um, gosh, I have a few up here, uh, he's working on Cat Sudoku right now, which is super cool, um, but Promenade is one that caught my attention, because it is this, like, ooh, dude, great artistic game, right, it is the game of art, limited edition here, um, and, uh, and it's, it's a very cool game, again, that has this weird mechanic that I love, which is the resources in the game are also, like, I want to spend them in two different ways, um, so similar to some of the ideas from Junk Orbit, but holy cow, in a different setting. Um, and I love it. Um, Tate is fantastic. Oh my gosh. Um, this game hooked me. Let's see how we... Oh, see? We'll get this into the right spot here. Um, welcome to Promenade, the game of art. Um, this board right here is a, a pretty dramatic board. There's a whole lot going on here. Um... And mostly it is kind of the centerpiece for a deck building game. So we don't need to look at this whole board the whole time, uh, but it is important to know how it works to understand this game because the, a lot of the end game stuff is right here in the middle. A lot of the early game stuff is actually down here at the bottom. So let me scoot that up a little bit so that we can see that a little bit better. Um, Promenade is all about artwork and you are a gallery owner and you are trying to create your own shows at some of the different major landmarks around town. Um, the Cezanne, Degas, Monet, Van Gogh, Renoir, uh, there are these very, very specific places that you can show off your paintings. Um, but in order to do that, you need to make a collection and then you'll be able to place a painting in these perfect spots. Um, all of these pieces of artwork, they are fantastic. There are these uh, portraits these are all uh, all designed by Tate, who is also the artist and the game designer. Um, there are these landscapes. We have some great animals here. The sea turtle is one of my favorite cards in the whole game. Um, I love getting it. Sailboat, we got some seascapes here as well. So the art is all very, very cool, and which is great because you're going to see these cards all the time. Like I said, this is a deck building game. Um, the starting hand of cards that you have, there are some gold cards. Uh, there are three ones. There are two twos, and then you start with five of these random paintings. Um, okay, well, if I start with a bunch of cards in a deck builder, they better be worth something, right? Because on my turn, I'm going to shuffle up this little deck, I'm going to draw five of these cards at random, and I'm going to see what I can do with them. All right. Um, now, it looks like, from the way the game works, there's some things out here that I can purchase in the game. Um, that should be fun. <laughs> Um, let's see, let's see how I want to do this. Um, well, no, I'm not going to put those on just yet, because we're missing the most important board in this game right now, which I'm going to just drop right in the middle. That's not where you should play with it in this game, by the way. So you're going to need this space. But right here we have The Market. This is a game of market manipulation. Definitely not like Junk Orbit right now. And it was a, a, uh, a thing that I was super intimidated by, when I learned how to play this game. Market manipulation? Okay, I'm not an economist. I don't know what's going on there. Um, but it's actually a very straightforward mechanic, and I love it. So I want to tell you how this works. I want you to hold on to your fear about a market manipulation game, because it's worth it. It's worth it. All right. As the game works, there are uh, a bunch of little numbers here that tell you how much these galleries cost to purchase paintings from. Okay, so there's some there's some targets right there. Um, that's good news. There's a couple 13s. There's some. There's a 14 here at the end. Um, and there's also a couple shorter numbers. And we are going to take these and we're going to place them one, two, three, and four right here. I hope we're seeing those numbers on the screen. Great. Um, and then we're going to take the other numbers and just kind of wrap the row up here. Eight, seven, six, and five. Perfect. We're ready to start. 
Um, this tells us how much money it costs in order to purchase one of the paintings from these locations. So down here at the, uh, at the, our first gallery, um, everything just costs one. I can only purchase uh, one, uh, one card at a time. Uh, I get two actions on my turn though. So potentially I can make multiple purchases on a turn, which is good. Um, the market board tells me how much these things are worth. At the start of the game, uh, these paint, oops, excuse me, that's not my hand. This is my hand. <laughs> Um, at the start of the game, these paintings aren't worth anything. Because there's, there's nothing on the board. But as soon as we start purchasing them, they're going to be worth money on their own. They become currency. So if on my turn I use a one coin here, and I play it, in order to purchase this yellow card from the one gallery at the front, well, that's going to take the yellow cube, and it's going to advance it two spaces on there. As it moves up... I look over to the left and that tells me two things. Number one, it tells me how much gold my yellow cards in my hand are now worth. So buying that was a good move. Um, but also how many victory points they're going to be worth at the end of the game. So by purchasing cards of a certain color, I'm increasing their value and I'm increasing how much money they're going to be worth in the end. Uh, that is a very, very big deal. Um, you can see that they are random, and I start the game with five at random. So, just checking in on the chat a little bit. So, um, so I want to get things that kind of build together, right? If I'm manipulating a market, I don't want to manipulate six markets all at the same time. That seems super, super hard. Maybe I want to focus on just a few of them. Um, so potentially, if I decide on yellow, I'm going to start buying yellows, but there's only a few out here. I don't see any reds out here. That's a problem. Um, I know I started with one red, and I want that to be worth something in the end. Um, we have a couple... Well, there's a few other mechanics in the game, of course. Um, there are also these gold depositories over here that give you better currency right from the get-go. Uh, you will see that they have currencies of three and five. If you look over here at the market board, three is not actually that far up the board, and five is, uh, is not the maximum. I could get things up to six. So these gold cards are not the maximum currency, it is having these paintings be purchased, be played with, be used, be part of our, our museum, be part of our, I don't know, uh, zeitgeist, our art zeitgeist. There we go. That might be right. <laughs> um, here's my favorite thing about the game. There, well, there's so many. Because first of all, I get these cool cards in my hand that I'm going to play with, and they are constantly changing in value. I love deck builders, so that is fantastic for me. I like gathering things and building a better and better and better deck. Um, and if you've played games like Ascension or Dominion or whatever else, then you're familiar with, with the deck building mechanic. As you purchase cards, your deck gets bigger, which means your cool cards you don't see as often. Um, unless you can somehow whittle your deck down. Um, let's see, Ascension does that. One of their uh, guilds is the Void Guild, and often they have a discard or a, a trash mechanic to get rid of some cards. Um, Dominion certainly has a trash mechanic to get rid of some cards. A lot of games don't. Um, Legendary is the game where you're like fighting superheroes. Or you, no, 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 you are a superhero fighting. Sorry, wrong way to say that. Um, but as you as you purchase cards to make your your character even better, you your deck just gets bigger and bigger. And there aren't that many heroes that let you trash cards in order to do something. Personally, I want those. I always go after them because I need those. There's other ways to get around it, like card draw. I can draw a bunch of cards, and this game does help with that because I have two actions every turn. One of them can be, I'm going to discard a card of my choice, and I'm going to draw two cards from my deck. That is the haggle action. Um, haggle action, pretty solid. Um, let's make it a little bit better in what I'm up to for the next turn, for my purchasing action, to make sure I have the money that I want. But Tate does another very, very smart thing here, which is while the paintings are all set... Um, and they have this fluctuating price as they go through. Actually, the, the gold cards that I start with, and I'll put one of them up here, has, uh, has two bits to it. Number one, up at the top, it says it's worth one dollar, one gold coin, whatever. Uh, but most importantly, down at the bottom, it says for three, buy one painting. Okay, that's not exactly what that means. That means, hey, if I am purchasing a painting, I can use this as a cost of, or a, a purchasing power of three instead. So simply by playing this card, for not its regular value, but its extra value, I get to spend three on buying a painting. So I could immediately buy one from this higher level, more expensive gallery. 
Not that this blue card is worth anything more than this blue card down here, but something's about to change, so hold on to that. When I play this for its bottom value, it is removed from the game. That's it. My deck is now one card smaller. I have used it to purchase a card. I can do that with as many cards as I want on my turn. Uh, if I want to at the start, I can use all of my coins in the same way. They're all worth exactly the same thing. I also have my, my level twos allow me to, uh, to act as four gold when purchasing a painting uh, during the buy step. All of that is fantastic. That allows me to, to really manipulate my deck a ton. If I purchase the three, it's going to give me a secondary ability as well. And there's actually many of them in here, so the abilities are all different. Um, the Fancy Noble, for example, lets me get eight in order to buy one or two paintings from the same gallery down here. Seems like a lot. I mean, these two are... Okay, hold on. There's got to be something else going on. Uh, Seeds of Wealth counts as eight to help me buy the five gold cards, and they cost eight. So that's, that's fantastic. That's just a free gold card. The fives don't have any way to get rid of them, but that's okay. Again, they're one of the top currencies in the game, so you might as well, once you get them, hold on to them. And that is a major strategy in the game. Also, purchasing gold puts gold up here um, and allows us, at the end of the game, to count how much gold value we have in our deck um, and turn that into victory points. And you will see that the market is very interesting because at some level, right, it goes up. It's like five to one. That's terrible. To three to one, three to one, two to one, one to one. Perfect. Two to, and then it gets worse. So as the gold counter moves up this market track, if it gets up too far, my gold is actually worth less uh, victory points at the end of the game. So I want to be careful about that and watch what other people are up to. Oh my gosh. How many choices are there in this game? Uh... Oh, okay, Jonathan just mentions. Jonathan, I'm so glad you're here making noise in the chat. This is fantastic. Uh, I appreciate it so much. Um, Jonathan mentions that uh, that his degree is in economics, and one, awesome. Um, I took a statistics proof class, and it was the only class I ever took with economics majors, and there was like this, this constant battle between us math folks and those economics folks about like who had the harder degree, <laughs> and it was petty and hilarious. Um, but Jonathan says, further than that, this mechanic is amazing. Um, I've not seen a better representation of market scarcity in a game before. This is also how the actual real art market works. I mean, that's awesome. That's fantastic. <laughs> um, I'm glad to hear that, because me, as a, a person who enjoys games, I love this, because market manipulation is is terrifying, and it I've seen a couple of games that have it, and it gets very difficult to actively do what you want in the game. But in this one... If I want yellow to go up, I buy yellow, and that means my yellow is better. I mean, that just seems as simplistic as possible. Um, and also, it does another couple cool things. If I see someone else going heavy on yellow, do I want to go heavy on green? Heck no, I kind of want to get in on that. I want to I want to help build yellow up, because now we're on the same team. We're, we're putting out the same sort of stuff, and everybody likes it, and great, it's worth a ton. Um, so I'm constantly building my deck to get better and better and better, I am whittling out these cards, like especially these starting ones and twos, which may not be so good anymore. And hopefully what I'm doing is taking my starting hand of paintings and making them as good as possible. You know, if I start with this, I I may be banking on purple here. Um, there's only one red, and again, I didn't see any red in the starting galleries, so forget that. Uh, green and yellow, we'll see what happens with those. But they might not be my primary goal. Um, okay, okay. So at the end of the game, these things are all worth points for being in our decks. But there's also these galleries out here. Um, or excuse me, the, the expositions, because I want to show these things off. Um, as the game progresses, I eventually want to show things off up there. And tuck this down a little bit. Sorry for moving the board constantly. I didn't, I moved it too far down. <laughs> uh, or too far up. These galleries have a price up here at the top. 17 to be in the Renoir Expo, 12 to be in the Degas, 11 in the Cezanne, um, and there's also a market rating next to them. If I can reach those high values on one turn, I can exhibit a painting as one of my two actions on every turn. Um, that means I'm going to take one of my cards, one of, one of my painting cards from my, my hand, and I'm going to place it here, right there, um, in order to let everybody know, hey, that's my painting. Um, only 12 paintings can be exhibited, and the game ends at that point. Um, when I do this, I'm going to go ahead and take some of my meeples. Let's say I'm blue. I'm going to put one of them right here so that I mark that that painting is mine. And I'm also going to put one here, giving me 12 victory points. 
and you'll see that each one of these, well, it's hard to see, <laughs> 98877 here in the Cezanne gallery. Uh, that one in particular is the lowest cost one to get into. It's worth the least amount of victory points. Notice seven is the worst number on here. I know I'm covering a few up, but I promise seven is the worst one on here. That is the best you can ever get out of a painting in your deck. So by exhibiting a painting, you are getting more points, period. And then your paintings are also worth points at the end of the game, right? So I want those things there. Okay, so the goal of the game is to get exhibits up, but at the same time, what do you want to exhibit? Well, you want to exhibit the things that will give you the most victory points. There are also some sub-goals in the game um, that may require you to be like, I want the most green in this gallery, I want the most red in this gallery, stuff like that. But you can watch as your victory points tick down, and as things get exhibited, you can watch the end of the game come ever closer. That is terrifying, and so you've got to start making moves in order to, to start placing there. I love that, first of all, because I can physically watch the end of the game come closer, and a game like... Dominion, as a great example, is not a deck builder where I can see the end of the game happening. Um, exactly. Right? I can watch a deck decrease, but it's only one deck. But I don't know how many points people have. Here, it's pretty darn obvious, because I can look and see, like, okay, that person is is got way too many points from over there. I'm stuck down here in the Cezanne Gallery, the, the, the worst one here, you know, whatever. Um, this other person has five paintings. I always try to go for tons of, of paintings and expositions. It, I often don't win this game, um, but that's what I try to do. I make my move too fast. How else does this game mess with you? How does it push you towards the end game mechanic? I love this part. Um, down here, the galleries. You know how I put all these silly numbers here in the first place? Um, these got to be worth something. They have to do something in the game, and they do, and they push the end game is what they do. These in the, the first gallery are the cheapest ones. They only cost one to purchase. But once they're all gone, great. I discard this one. I take the lowest price in this list, and I put it right there. Now that one's five to purchase <laughs> instead. So now I have two, three, four, five. And basically, at the start of the game, these things are going to run out super, super, super fast. And so we might be buying these, and the prices are just going to go up. And then I replace them with however many cards are down here at the bottom. These don't have to go in order, so it's not necessarily true that the three is going to go to the seven. In fact, we might buy the four out first, turn that into a seven, and then this three, later on, is going to jump way up to an eight. Right? At some point, as your deck gets better, your ability to purchase these paintings gets much more difficult. And I find this, first of all, to be fascinating, uh, but also really, really important in how the game works. So, here, we can see that basically at some point, 11, 12, 13, 14, those are basically the same prices as 11, 12, 13, right? The lower exhibitions. So the game is telling me at some point, I want to stop buying paintings. I want to be exhibiting instead up there, which is very, very cool. I can still purchase these cards. It'll just cost me a bunch to do. And at the same time, that's important because again, those, those are going to be worth something at the end of the game. So buying paintings is very good. I often lose to someone who is very, very good at purchasing paintings as long as possible and building this ridiculous deck that's just filled with like seven po six and seven point paintings. It's a perfectly valid strategy. Um, and that's why this game is, is, to me, really, really amazing is because those strategies both exist. Um, but to finish this up, let's talk real quick about a game like Ascension. Ascension is my favorite example of this. As you're playing Ascension, you have your deck at the start, and you're filled with these, you know, stupid cards that you want to get rid of. They're bad. And there are slightly better versions of those available. If I want more runes, I can get the Mystic, which costs, like, three, a, you know, trifle to purchase, and it's only worth two runes. Most of the cards in the deck are better than that, but those are always there. So if the cards I want don't show up, I can buy those instead. There's also the same thing for, like, Military Power. At the end of the game, I have played that game with people, and as I am ready to run it down, because it can end very quickly, people are still buying those, and they're worth like one and two, or one point each at the end of the game, which is nothing, nothing at all. But the game doesn't tell me to stop buying those. It just says, do what you want, you know, here are some options, have fun. This game pushes us to make choices in really interesting ways. So, 
First of all, it's not saying, like, whittle down your deck, you know, that's a nice option, but you don't have to do it. No, 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 you're going to do it. You're totally going to do it. Your deck will just get better as the game progresses. Your paintings are going to be worth more money because you're going to buy paintings of the same kind. Other people are going to buy paintings. This will go up. There's, <laughs> I've played one game, and it was really fun, uh, where one of these just sat at the bottom. No one ever bought a green one or something like that. Um, for the longest time, because there weren't any out at the start, and then, like, midway through the game, they're just not worth anything, so why do it? Um, meanwhile, at the end of the game, people started to buy them because there were a bunch of them, and uh, you could buy them relatively quickly. So as that price, you know, it was about manipulating the price and making it high enough to be, like, a worthy competition to these other players who, you know, have different strategies at that point. This game, again, I want to talk about it at the same time I talk about Junk Orbit because it has this 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 thing this problem it has it's not a problem it's a, it's a feature um that if i get purple all the way up here to 55 if my purple paintings count as a currency of five as i'm playing the game do i want to hold on to this use the rest of my hand to show this and remove it from my deck forever I mean, it's worth victory points to do, and it'll be worth those points at the end of the game. It's important to do, but now, as the game continues, I have made my deck worse by doing it. Specifically worse. Um, I could put low-cost paintings up there and hope that I can manipulate their prices as the game continues. If I just show greens, like I was just saying, and then I just buy all the greens I can to up that price, that could work. I could manipulate the market to my advantage in that way. Um, but if other players are manipulating the other colors, that gets very, very tricky. So there are tons of choices in this game. There are a couple of mitigations that, that help out with that. You know, like the first painting that gets played, you can take a little bonus. The first few, you get a small bonus either in victory points or in cost reduction to make it easier to place those. But really, as soon as people stop purchasing paintings and start exhibiting paintings, the game changes very quickly. Like, the start is this fast-paced, let's buy all these things, and, and everything goes up, and it's great. Um, but uh, but it can just change on a dime, absolutely. Just, just turn, and suddenly you realize, oh wait, everybody just exhibited a painting, someone's doing their second painting, we're up to seven paintings exhibited, and I am not ready for that. I, what am I going to do? How do I win this game? Um, right, as soon as you're late, all these victory points go down and down and down, and so that can be a problem. Just to talk a little bit more about Tate's game before getting into that game theory bit, because it is, whoo, it is, it is a deal. Um, there are, Tate put this game out with a bunch of expansions that he had come up with. There are, for example, there are specific elements that show up in each of the expositions, that are kind of like side goals. So there are other ways to get victory points beyond just these. There are other tangible goals in the game. Because right now from the start, there's really not a ton. I mean, the paintings I start with in my hand give me some sense about what I should be interested in. Let's go, I'll just throw that on there. Um, if I started with these five paintings, I mean, I, I want purple to win, I guess. But I don't really know exactly how I'm going to go about doing that. If I have those side goals up there, they might be like, all right, the Van Gogh expedition, or <laughs> expedi exposition, wants to have the most red, whoever has the most red in this section gets to um, get some sort of victory bonus at the end, gets, uh, gets to add two points to all their red paintings or something like that. There are also, he was amazing as this game was coming out, as this Kickstarter was happening, there are cards for, like specifically painted cards for certain animals that he liked a lot, so there's a bunch of cat paintings in there, which is great. Um, there are also cards based on certain Patreon backers that he had, or people who backed his game at a certain level. So those are all cool. They all have, you know, different art mechanics. Well, different art mechanics. Different mechanics and different art at the same time. Which is very, very cool. It was just a really good way to kind of exhibit this game. Um, as the Kickstarter was wrapping up, we did a quick tournament here in town. Uh, I was very happy to be able to take place. I did not win. I did not even advance to the finals. Mostly because... Uh, I made my, my jump too soon. There There is a jump, there is a turning moment in a lot of games where you have to do this. Um, where I decided to start exhibiting too soon, and I wasn't building up my paintings well enough. 
to, to give an example about how that works, I want to talk about a slightly different game, which with also has this feel. It is so frustrating. There's a game uh, that I played once upon a time. Stop shaking, floor. <laughs> that is uh, about Egypt, and you play a pharaoh in the game, um, and you are trying to amass power in the world so that you could become a stronger pharaoh. Um, but at the same time, victory is all about what you can take with you into the afterlife, and so you have to prepare your tomb by taking those powerful things that you discover and burying them. Like, you have to entomb them as an action. And when the game ends, which is, there's a fixed moment when the game ends. Cars. You can see them coming. And if you haven't entombed enough things, when the game ends, you lose. But at the same time, when you entomb stuff, you lose that power in the world, which allows you to play the game and take the actions that you want. It's a beautiful mechanic, frustrating, as all get out, because I hate making that choice. Like, I want to make it be as strong as I can, and that's how you lose that game, is by neglecting the Entomb action. This is a very similar idea to it. If I neglect expositions, if I neglect exhibiting my paintings, I can lose out on a ton of victory points. But the market helps me get back into the game at the end by allowing these paintings to be worth a ton of victory points. So if I'm exhibiting things, my deck is smaller, I've made it a little bit worse, where is the balance there and exactly how do we make those choices as the game progresses? It's a very cool exploration. This game is fun. It's great. And it doesn't take all that long. Honestly, this is a 45-minute game. I think the first time we played it in the tournament, we were done in 25 minutes. So we all knew exactly what we wanted and we were just like, bam, 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 bam. So it can move very quickly, which is amazing for a game that manipulates a market. Like, are you kidding me? Um, I am terrified of stock and market games. They just, they just worry me. But this one is ideal. It's so dang good. All right. So again, both of these, what I wanted to talk about today was really this concept that, that many games have where you are trying to make choices between how you expend your resources. We look at this in terms of let's a good example even in role playing games is like uh fourth edition D, D. there we go uh, which had these uh uh do, do 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 i'm just blanking on them um in fifth edition they are hit dice oh i'll just do fifth edition what they do is they allow you to heal in between big combats you can take a little rest and like wrap you know bandage yourself up and you get some healing in the eberron book that came out there is a mechanic in there where instead of using them for healing, you can use them for other purposes. And suddenly you have to make choices about a very limited resource that you have. Do you want to be able to heal yourself after a battle? Or do you want to use those hit dice in order to do a unique effect? And suddenly, suddenly I am stuck. And I'm like, oh no, what, do, what am I going to do? It's a little bit different, I think, than having a, a resource with like five options, five different ways to expend that resource. Because then you still feel this kind of limitation going on. But, but there, it's it's very much like, this is meant for this one thing, and if I use it for this other thing, now it's gone. It's kind of lost. And that's that's a strange, strange, strange place to be in, for sure. Promenade, or Promenade, excuse me, shows it so well. Tate has done such an excellent job with this game. I love it. Um, and uh, I, I really hope you get the chance to play it. It was not a huge Kickstarter. I'm very happy to have the limited release. Um, if we go a place, I'll try and bring it with me. We'll play this game. Um, but otherwise, get Junk Orbit as well. The game is all over the... Where did it go? I'll put it on the floor. <laughs> junk Orbit. This is a fantastic game. You can get it all sorts of places. Um, it's a great thing to put up, like, way up high on your shelf so that it looks super cool that you can see it up there. Um, got cool artwork, and also it's about junk throwing it around space, which is very, very cool. And again, Promenade. Uh, check out Tate. I would I would follow Tate, try and find more of his, his mini games. He's got great ideas, and I absolutely love playing his games. Uh, all right, what are we at? We're at, like, uh, the oven says it's 11.54, so I just want to check in real quick, see if we got any last questions from folks who may be watching. I'm just looking at Twitch real quick. Uh, looks like we've wrapped most of our things up, which is great. Um, definitely. Definitely, definitely. Check these games out. Like, look for more games that are like these. Games that that ask you to make hard choices as you play it, where you are unsure about what the outcome is going to be, right? Uh, this isn't like walk left or walk right, like check this tunnel or check this tunnel. It's not clank where you're you're kind of moving through a map. Like I'm making permanent game altering decisions when I decide to do certain things and I have to, I'm forced to. That's the way the game works. 
in Junk Orbit, I gotta throw that junk back so that I can move forward. Like, how do I decide what is the best choice there? There's no great way to do it unless you can play. Play, play, play. Find out. In uh, in Promenade, do you, I don't know, do you dump them early? Do you, do you start exhibiting as fast as you can? Do you build your deck in order to be a ex exhibition machine? But then people are already, oh my gosh, there's so much. Um, and someone tell me the name of that Pharaoh game because I can't remember it for the life of me. Uh, it's been years since I have played that. Um, all right. Whew. Oven o'clock. Oven o'clock. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. I really, really do appreciate you coming and listening to me talk about games and talk about game school. I think school is very, very important, especially even on a Sunday. We can do school in the morning. It's perfect. Um, if you would like to hear more of these things, you can not find them apparently it's gone it's gone it's a mystery we'll just call that a big blank uh, i'll put that up on youtube so you can see it there um, but you can absolutely find atomic game theory uh and you can find me on twitter at armelina for sure atomic game theory is atomicgametheory.com and you can find this episode and a whole bunch of other posts and things over there Let's just learn more about games games all the time it's the best thing in the world uh, don't go away all of those things i have really appreciated you all being here and, uh, and I hope we get to do this. Well, we will. We'll get to do this next week. I'll see you then. Um, until then, just play more games. Play more games. Play more games forever. All right. Thank you. Goodbye.